All right, here we are, folks, back for part two of this 2.01 set of notes. Um, there was a lot of problem between the U.S. and Mexico at this time. Um, President Polk even sent a guy named John Slidell to talk to the Mexican government, wanting to offer to buy New Mexico and California, much as we have bought Louisiana from France. The Mexican government refuses to talk to him, so Slidell's rejection ends up being one of the key points between the U.S. and Mexico um, heading towards war. But the big thing that led into war with Mexico was when General Zachary Taylor's troops were ordered to the Rio Grande River. All right, the border between the U.S. and Mexico right here is the Rio Grande between Texas, uh, at the southern tip of Texas. And Zachary Taylor will eventually become president. Um, his nickname was Old Rough and Ready. And you can see here on this map that the, the Nueces River is right here. The Rio Grande's right here. So there's about 100 miles of territory between the Nueces and the Rio Grande, but this was disputed territory. Mexico claimed that the border between Mexico and Texas was the Nueces. The U.S. claimed that the border was the Rio Grande. So because of this dispute, shots ended up being fired where President, excuse me, future President Zachary Taylor's troops were ambushed by Mexican troops. President Pope gives a speech to Congress where he claimed that American blood was shed upon American soil and Congress declared war on Mexico. Now, not all Americans were on board with this war right away. A lot of Americans felt like this was a war that was being fought just to extend Southern power and to extend slavery. Um, I mentioned when we talked about Henry David Thoreau, one of the Transcendentalist writers, that he was thrown in jail for a short time because he refused to pay his taxes because this was the time of the Mexican War and he had wanted to support a war that would expand slavery. Um, I've got here Abraham Lincoln the spot resolutions. Abraham Lincoln as a young Whig in the House of Representatives at this time actually introduced resolutions asking for President Polk to show him the spot where American blood was shed on American soil because a lot of Whigs kind of doubted this. Alright so the US mobilizes and you had 50,000 people volunteer. Remember this was not at a time when we had a large standing army so you would have to recruit troops whenever you went to war. Um, the war was a pretty clear-cut victory for the United States. Now, from what little you can see from this drawing, or it might be an engraving, um, you can see this is a war that's fought definitely old style. It's not a modern war yet. Um, troops are still carrying the single-shot rifles or muskets with bayonets on the end of them. Um, and they would still be doing that in the Civil War 14 years after this. But the U.S. won several victories. One of the generals that really makes a name for himself would be the head general for the Union during the Civil War. Winfield Scott gets the nickname Old Fuss and Feathers for always trying to be a stickler about Army regulations. I'm not going to go much into the details of the Mexican War in this lecture. We will hit on that later. But the war ends with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And through that, the U.S. gains the Mexican Cession, which Mexico lost half of its territory. And all this pink area right here, which is we see California, um, Utah, New Mexico, Nevada. Actually, I'm sorry, I didn't list their states correct. But basically, the American Southwest today becomes a part of the United States through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. All right, the issue of slavery was never far from most people's minds, though. Um, a congressman named David Wilmot introduced a bill trying to say that no slavery would ever be allowed in these lands that were part of the Mexican session. This was eventually defeated, but it shows that Northerners are kind of on the edge of their seats anytime this new territory is added to the Union, especially territory in the South like that, worried that it might extend slavery. Um, I probably should have put this a few slides earlier. This shows the campaigns of the Mexican War. If you see down here, Winfield Scott marched on Mexico City there's a famous story where a lot of the, or several of the Mexico City um, younger defenders ended up committing suicide by jumping off of a cliff rather than surrender to the Americans. Um, some of the bigger places with battles this war, Monterey, um, again, Mexico, Veracruz. Then there's also a good portion of this war that happens up and down what we would call California, which again at that time was um, part of Mexico. And actually, well, California was an independent republic for a the time too. You see here a guy named Kearney's listed here. Stephen Kearney makes what was called the Long March from Leavenworth, Kansas all the way out to San Diego. 
All right, but after California becomes part of the United States, a lot of U.S. settlers start moving to California. This is an activity we're going to do probably on Monday. Um, if you pay attention to the NFL, the San Francisco football team is named the 49ers. All right, you know that team that forgot to show up against the Seahawks on Sunday and cost me some fantasy football points. Uh, 49ers were my defense. This is for the settlers that rushed to California in 1849 because gold was discovered at a place called Sutter's Mill in 1848. All right, so everybody runs out there next year are called 49ers. Um, we'll talk more about the gold rush in the next couple of days, but some people did go out and strike it rich. Some people, you know, went out and had nothing to show for it. But you got to think, the people that are going out trying to get wealthy are not really the ones that already had a nice life back east. It's the people that were kind of down on their luck. But pay very close attention to this right here. The gold rush brings diversity to California. You should know that term diversity means you have a lot of people of various backgrounds, various nationalities, ethnicities, all grouped into one area. And California is a very ethnically diverse state today, and it goes back to this. All right. We eventually completed the map of the lower 48 states, not counting Hawaii and Alaska, with the Gadsden Purchase, which is this really dark area right here. So there's a small strip of land in the um, southwestern U.S. that we purchased from Mexico, 1853, so several years after the end of the Mexican War, with the intent of building the Southern Transcontinental Railroad. Um, there's a close-up view of it. See, it's the bottom portion of Arizona and New Mexico. All right, but one thing that you have to keep in mind as we talk about the uh, expansion of the country was that the expansion of the country really brought a division of the country. Because there was always that question of whenever a new territory was added, would slavery expand into those territories? And also remember the Missouri Compromise from 1820 has said that any new territory south of the Missouri Compromise line of 3630, slavery would be allowed. And north of 3630, slavery would not be allowed. But we'll see that didn't always stick.